Welcome to Halting Towards Zion, the podcast where we limp like Jacob to the promised land and talk about life, the universe, and everything else along the way. I'm your host this time, Brian Broom, and I'm joined today by Emily Maxson and Greg Uttinger. Today we are going to be continuing our, dis- our I guess, our march through Old Testament history and uh, having recently covered the topic, the person of Jezebel, we are going to cover the prophet Elijah. Elijah is most well known for his confrontation with the prophets of Baal, where he calls down fire, but there's more to him than just that. And so we're going to talk a bit more about what led up to that, the covenant that Elijah called upon God to remember, including its covenant stipulations and its sanctions. Uh, So Greg, why don't you get us started? The background here is that Ahab and Jezebel have established Baal worship as the state religion in Israel, the Northern Kingdom. Uh, Baal worship, as we've seen before, is rooted in the idea that all's divine, but some powers are a little more divine than others. And if man being divine can harness those powers, well, then he can get stuff he wants, stuff he needs, like crops and children and peace on earth and things like that. God, in this sense, becomes a series of impersonal forces that man through magic manipulates. Baal was particularly the masculine side of nature, the lightning, the storm, the rain that impregnates Mother Earth, everything big and boisterous and powerful, but necessary. Asherah or Astaroth or Stati is the feminine side, Mother Nature, the, the womb, the fertility of the land and all that. The Political advantage to this was that the king, and possibly the queen serving as high priestess, um, become social engineers on a cosmic level. If they can practice the magic that makes nature do what nature's supposed to do, then they're really, really important. People should really listen to them, obey them, serve them, give them stuff. Uh, And so it would be very um, embarrassing if suddenly nature stopped doing those things. And notice nature being used here as an abstract noun, which is to them more or less what it was. There was no personal Baal. In fact, Baal is not even an anthropomorphic god as such. Baal simply means Lord. Might as well just say local deity and you're close, you're close enough. So, but but this this whole process is a violation of the first and second commandment at the very least, and probably every other commandment along the way. In the midst of this apostasy, suddenly at Ahab's court, a man shows up. He is described elsewhere as hairy, probably a Nazarite, girded with a leather girdle, and um, rough and confrontational. And he simply says, As the Lord God of Israel liveth, before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these years, but according to my word. And he runs, leaves. And at some, yeah, at some point, they, they probably searched the record books. And who was that anyway? His name's Elijah, 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 the Tishbite. Elijah means my God is Jehovah. Unfortunate name, Jezebel perhaps would comment. But no one took him seriously right away. I mean, it's, it's, it's rude. It's bad press. It, the optics don't go well on this one. But he's gone, and nobody seems to have noticed. We don't really know where where he is. He was from Gilead. They may have tracked that down. But as the weeks turn into months, and the months turn into years, and there's no rain, so at some point, somebody probably remembers this and says, um, do you think he could have something to do with this? And his story goes on from there. In the book of James... We're told a little bit more that Kings does not tell us. This is what James says about Elijah. First of all, he says, The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Elijah was a man subject to like passions as we are, and he prayed earnestly that it might not rain, and it rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months. And he prayed again, and the heavens gave rain and brought forth her fruit. What Kings didn't tell us is 
we, we might have the impression that God simply appeared to Elijah and said, go tell them there's not going to be any rain. That's actually not what happened. Apparently, Elijah looked at the apostasy and said, this is covenant breaking. And he knew the law well enough. He knew Leviticus, what, 26 and Deuteronomy 28. And the passage is saying basically that when God's people go into idolatry, into apostasy, God will withhold rain. The heavens will be brass, the earth will be, uh, be bronze or iron, and basically the crops aren't going to grow. God will shut down your agricultural system. So Elijah actually prayed that Israel would get no rain. And God honored the prayer. God apparently came to Elijah and said, well, you called for it. You got to go tell him. And so for three and a half years, and the number's not mentioned in, um, in Kings, but both Jesus and here James do mention the exact length of time. For three and a half years, there's no rain. And the grass dies and the cattle begin to dehydrate and die and people don't have water. It's getting really, really bad. And we'll see later what breaks that, how it comes to an end. But we're told, and this is pretty clear from the, from the text later on in Kings, that Elijah, satisfied that God's sanctions have done their work, prays, and within a very short time, God sends rain again. The lesson here for God's people, James tells us, is that the fervent effectual, the fervent, effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much, and he points to Elijah with regard to these very things, not raining and then raining. And it's that connection, I think, that some Christians have trouble with. Now, we, we are all good Calvinists. And we, I, I believe we all agree that Scripture is completed. You know, there's no more kind of special revelation going on. If you read the textbooks on theology, you will probably find some definition of miracle that says that these were done to credential God's servants, the prophets and the apostles, and particularly to credential their messages. And then since the Bible is completed, and this is what you will have here. God does not do miracles anymore. I think there's a problem with that formulation. And I, I think a lot hinges on what do you mean miracle? Right. <laughs> define our terms <laughs> let's, here. Let's define our terms here. Uh, the, uh, now, the Westminster Standards are really good, actually, on this. And unfortunately, I don't have them in front of me. Uh, but they speak very well of God's sovereign power to work through means, without means, and beyond means. And the verbs are present tense. God can still work beyond normal means we would expect. He can work without any kind of means. He has not abandoned that. To put it a little differently, by completing the Bible, he didn't tie himself up in a straitjacket and bind himself to the laws of Newtonian mechanics. He, he did not lock himself into cause and effect to the point that, well, I'd love to give you rain, but there are no rain clouds for coming for a long time. I'm sure they'll get here. And we've kind of picked up the idea, and I, it depends on who you are. This is not universal, but I've seen enough of it, where we say, okay, so the sign gifts are over, so there are no miracles. Therefore, if you have, let us say, uh, incurable cancer, then it's incurable cancer. And it would take a miracle of reversal of natural laws to cure it. Therefore, it cannot be cured. God will not have a miracle worker, a healer, come in and heal you. we we'll probably agree with that one. But neither will God, neither can God heal you because it's incurable cancer. Laws of cause and effect and all that. You can pray well, that it we won't know hurt. that it can't be cured because it's incurable. Right. Yeah, so there, QED. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Uh, and, and there are Christians who will not pray for someone with some disease that's been labeled incurable because uh, that would take a miracle and God doesn't do miracles. And there's a problem. Because the very kind of thing that Elijah prayed for, both the, the, the stopping of the rain and more particularly the return of the rain, looked pretty miraculous. He did not consult weather charts or Doppler radar to see what the possibilities or likelihood or statistical averages might be on rain during that season or, <laughs> you know, trace it back. Okay, given the weather, weather, weather patterns on the planet, 
uh, is it is it reasonable to believe that in X number of months or years, the rain will still not come? Okay, so I can now ask God to do something about that because it, now it's easy for God. God, God. God can just bump a little bit with normal processes and, and it, what? And then at the end, when it's time to, when to ask God for rain, he simply bows down, kneels down, <clears throat> and starts praying. And he sends his servants, says, go, go look at the, uh, the Mediterranean. Is, is anything going on there? Nope. Okay, pray some more. Go look. Nope. Go pray some more. Uh, okay, go look. No, nope. seven times. Seventh time. There's this little cloud way out to the size of a man's hand. That's it. Let's get out of here. Get down. Tell they have to get out of here. It's the rain's coming. A short time before, there had been no, no rain clouds on the horizon. And suddenly there are rain clouds. To put it really simply, we have to ask ourselves, does prayer change things? Now, we, that question can mean a number of things. So the question itself has to be defined. Does God change his mind? No. God's immutable. We know this. Does God act in a way so that from our perception, it seems that he has changed his mind? Yes, the Bible uses that phrase all the time. I repent of the Lord that he had done this or that. Uh, so what's going on here? When we pray, are we simply aligning and attuning our thought processes to God's will with no expectation or hope that physical reality will actually be altered at all? That is, is prayer largely meditation without effect? Or if we ask God for X, like rain, will God give us rain, whereas if we had chosen not to ask, he would not have? That is, does God listen to prayer to the point of changing the apparent course of things in response to what his children ask of him? Absolutely. Absolutely. But there are a lot I of... Think, Go ahead. I think, uh, especially for people who acknowledge predestination and foreknowledge and the um, laying out of history by God, it, it seems like a trap, a trick mm. question yeah. to <laughs> answer that. And it's like, uh, I won't answer. Ha-ha! You know, <laughs> but really, it, it it is that simple. It is, yeah, of course he does. Of course he listens. And of course what we think is going to happen in the future is not always what he even planned out from before time began. Sometimes he uses our prayers as means. Yeah. Does, does God work through means? Yeah. Sometimes those means are our prayers rather than anything in a domino sort of chain reaction. Um, and that's what we're looking at. It did God at the beginning, is, is God the deistic sort of God who set up all the conditions push the first domino over, and through history they fall. And he's smart enough to know that uh, the rain clouds will be there just in time, just before or just after we ask for them, and it was all set up from the beginning. Well, yes, that's true. But... Sort of, in, in a sense. <laughs> but is it also true that God can... I don't like to use the word intervene because that's not what he's doing. Can God, who has been running the universe after a certain fashion, by his personal immediate providence, suddenly do a left-hand turn and say, yeah, yeah I, I, I know the wind was blowing this way. Now it's going to blow that way. And, um, yeah, not, your weather scanners didn't predict this at all, nor could they have. I'm, I'm, I'm changing things. And so here's the thing, then, if, if we admit that, are we saying, well, then God does miracles and anything's possible and we're not sure of any science. God could just change anything randomly. Or are we saying, no, if, if, we, if we were smart as God, we, we could step back and we could see all of the chain reactions leading to this. God doesn't actually run the universe. He set it up and pushed the first button. And now it just goes on autopilot. Well, and, and this is something I, I thought of earlier. I don't remember exactly what it was you said that triggered this thought. Mm -hmm. But when we when we think of God's miraculous acts in history as, oh, now God is acting. Right. Now he's 
upset the natural law right. to bring about the intent of the fact. You're just treating God like he is a very large superhero with yeah. a particular set of abilities to upset natural laws. It's like, oh, well, he's Iron Man at this point now, and he lives in the clouds. That's what he is, mm -hmm. uh, even if you wouldn't obviously put it that way. The fact is that because God is running everything, he is intimately involved in every you know, nanosecond of creation, mm -hmm. upholding it by the power of his very word. He gets to do whatever he wants. He's mm -hmm. normally, I mean, we call it normative. Mm -hmm. He's normally very, very faithful in making sure gravity works the way it does. It's consistent yeah. everywhere. But when his glory is better suited for it or his purposes are better suited for it, he will gladly change the way things work for the sake of his covenant people, for the sake of his own glory, for... Uh, Really, those are the two main reasons we yeah, see scripture. Pretty but, much, um, yeah. you know, I, I think of when the sun is held at bay, mm -hmm. when when Israel is battling one, one of the pagan tribes. I can never keep track of which battle that is. Uh, there's so many pagan tribes that they fight. Well, they were fighting quite a number at that point. They'd all got together and were going to jump on Israel. God oh, had well, that's why I couldn't keep yeah, track of them. God had loaned them out of their cities to all attack Israel, so Israel could destroy them. Um, I always God. think and of yeah. the Hobbit and the Battle of the Five Armies. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> Somehow I never made that connection. Anyway, you were saying, Brian. But yeah, it's like for that very purpose, it's for his own glory. It's for the protection of his covenant people. He also includes a means, which is very prayer-like, at least in its... Um, in the way it is used as a means where as long as Moses' arms are up and Bam. and he is you know quote unquote holding back time and uh who who were the two was, was it Joshua and it was Aaron Nathan? and I, Aaron sorry her her yeah that's right so you know there's that uh <laughs> to to draw another comparison the three braided cord that mm -hmm. um is is there being used as god's means for his own glory in the act of from our perspective upsetting the natural flow of time the, the word i had used before was intervention god does not intervene in the sense that god set things up to run like an orderly computer program say but he can push pause and then do something and then back out and put resume as as if the rest of the time he's not running things, uh, he, he, you know, it's not like he has to let his mana recharge. He's yeah. not a <laughs> he's not a, a, a priest in D and D. Yeah, <laughs> no, he he is the one who personally runs the universe. I one of my favorite psalms, is Psalm one hundred and four, which is just one long ode to the providence of God, where we're told in no uncertain terms, He makes the grass to grow, He hmm. sends the showers. Um, he feeds the animals. This is God personally doing these things. He did not set up a system that he doesn't have an automatic sprinkler system. He himself pours out the rain by his hand, by his divine power, according to his divine and immediate purpose. Yes, he planned everything. Absolutely. But if we lead, and, and I remember the first time I heard a lecture on this, it was by uh, R.J. Rush, and I heard it on tape. It's the first time I'd ever heard a discussion of providence. I was like ninth grade or something. And it was a turning point in my thinking because I had been taught to be a good Calvinist and believe in predestination. But my idea was, so God planned everything and, and then let it go and, and everything runs according to the plan. Notice everything runs and God just dropped out of the equation. He set it up. He made it push it down the hill and it's running. And then we're back to, and a miracle is when God intervenes in, and breaks a natural law. No. Well, first of all, and this is, um, this is a question I've asked in a number of times, mostly in educational settings and lecturing to some teachers or something. And the question is, I always say, this is a trick question. No one ever pays attention. <laughs> no one ever pays attention to, okay, then don't give the answer you think you should. Okay. The question is, true, <laughs> true or false, God created the natural laws that run the universe. And Who runs the universe? Yeah, <laughs> exactly. But everyone hears the word created. God created. Oh, yeah, I'm a, a six-day creationist. I believe God created. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. No. 
I stop them after they've all raised their hands and agreed, yes, God warned them as a trick question. Um, <laughs> God created the natural laws that run the universe. I said, okay, you're all wrong. What? There are no natural laws that run the universe. God runs the universe personally and immediately by his providence, whereby as it were by his hand, the catechism says, uh, all things come to pass, not by chance, but by his fatherly hand, his personal oversight, his personal providence, his personal power applied in time and space at every given moment and every given point of space. He is the one actively bringing these things to pass. Jesus is actively upholding all things by the word of his power 24 7 everywhere in the universe all the time well then people say well, but wait, wait, what's natural law then natural law as brian said earlier is simply god's faithfulness god is so faithful that we can measure out his providence in terms of predictable relationships so predictable we can put numbers to them the force exerted on an object is equal to its mass and acceleration because that's the way God runs the universe. Um, uh, I not. remember, I, I'm sorry if I'm interrupting you. No, go ahead. I remember several years ago um, in an astronomy class at the local community college, public college, and the teacher was to an extent blatantly but you know he was couching it in in some very like hand wavy language <laughs> uh, crit crit criticizing christianity and criticizing theism in general and one of the things he was talking about was like oh you know you get these these people that that go around and uh they say like oh this thing we don't understand in science that's that's the thing that god is doing and then we figure out how that works and they go, okay, well now he's doing this. He's still doing this other thing we don't understand yet. And it's like, it was playing into that very same idea that it's natural laws that run the universe. And obviously the ones we, we don't have natural laws for, we haven't understood scientifically. Those things are all, you know, the, we have the God of the gaps who, who yeah. fills in the gaps of our scientific understanding. And I never got really much of a chance to talk to him one-on-one -on -one about that just because of the virtue of the class. Mm -hmm. uh, but I remember thinking, it's like, this This isn't a problem. This is not the problem that <laughs> he thinks it is or that, that the people who, who make those claims think that it is. It's like, oh, no, we, oh, there's so little that God's doing because he only takes care of these things that we, we don't understand. And that's just <laughs> patently false. Yeah. He's the God <laughs> he, of the he's irrational. Running everything. He yeah. runs... I mean, even if we don't, I mean, like, if you, if you talk to some physicists, they'll be like, oh, yeah, we don't know what makes gravity work. Like, we, we can describe it, but we don't know what makes it work. Right, it's this weird right. thing. But there's other things that we do understand how they work. And right. we, we, we can express in, in mathematical terms and in logical, uh, rational terminology. And God runs those things, too. Just because we can describe <laughs> them rationally doesn't mean that it's suddenly the domain of faith. It, I mean, we're not... Uh, who who is it that was it Kierkegaard who did the leap of faith thing? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. We're, even I don't know that that's necessarily the most accurate interpretation of actually what he was saying. But still, if you take it that way, we're not like that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> reminds me of Terry Pratchett's line: "Just because you know how it works doesn't mean it's not magic." Yeah, yes. <laughs> and just because so, we 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 can describe the pattern and predict the outcome does not mean it's not God. It just means God's very faithful, which is what he told Noah after the flood. And, and yep. I'm, I'm going to go ahead and read this for the sake of people who may not know the passage as well. Um, you know, God had just destroyed the planet with a flood. That was kind of a big deal. And, it, well, and, and, and facing, facing a new world, it would be easy to think, well, is that going to happen again? Is, is our future at all predictable? Or is it stable? And Should God's, we bother building a city? Yeah, it's going to be wiped out by a flood. So yeah, God, God may just all that, and 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 God says this. He said, "While the earth remaineth," this is Genesis eight twenty two. While the earth remaineth, seed time and harvest, and cold and heat, and summer and winter, and day and night shall not cease. First of all, God makes promises. This means He does control all of these things. He promises to maintain a relative faithfulness. You know, the day-night thing, there was a couple times when the day-night thing slid a little for God's own purposes. But Can when, I yeah. interrupt and 
maybe push back on that phrasing because mm-hmm. I think I would have a hard time saying God's faithfulness is relative. <laughs> like I yeah. think his faithfulness is absolute, but the consistency with which he administers it or the way in which he administers the way in which he administers it, yeah. It might change to suit his purposes. Yeah. He said day and night shall not cease. Well, they didn't. They just got extra long on one occasion. Right. <laughs> A little so, stretched. No, people people could point at that and say, mm, well, he, he again is not binding himself to the point where he can't do unusual things, including sign miracles, but also including very odd and radical answers to prayer if he wants to. Seed time and harvest, that's binding together the biological processes in plants with the um orbit of the earth around the sun and its tilt on its axis, the seasons. Uh, Cold and heat. The movement of cold and heat is called thermodynamics. It's the foundation of both physics and chemistry. If we don't know that things move from a hot into cold, the whole universe goes upside down. Uh, Summer and winter, again, the tilt of the planet on its axis and the constant planetary spin. Uh, and, and, And so with day and night, too. These are basic astrophysical and thermodynamic realities that God promises. These will be relatively consistent, or he will faithfully execute them, though not always the way you might think, because he, again, my point is, and and to James' point, I think, is that he's not putting himself in the straight jacket to the point where I, 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 he, he has to do it exactly this way every single time. One time he stopped the sun and the moon and the sky. One time he moved so he was smarter than the the Medes and the Persians. Yeah, <laughs> who would write yeah. a law and then not be able to do anything yeah. about it. He, as, as Brian said earlier, it's about his glory and the good of his people. And so, if changing things a little bit, or maybe even a lot, can help those things along in such a way that he deems to be really good. We we may or may not agree. We may think we <laughs> we may think the prayer needs to be answered this way right now. And he may say, yeah, no, actually it doesn't. And sometimes we may say, well, I pray this, but I mean, it's not like God's going to instantaneously cancer or something. Um, how about if I do, <clears throat> do that just to jump you out of your lethargy and remind you who, who you're dealing with. Uh, but this is, this is, God's prerogative. We can't dict to, dictate to him. We can't force a miracle. And again, this the prayer's not magic. It's his children asking the one who is absolutely sovereign, omnipotent, all wise, to minister yeah. to us in ways that we, with our limited understanding and weak faith, believe we need help. And sometimes we're right on. Sometimes we're a little bit off. Sometimes we're way off. But he has promised as a good father to give us good gifts. And he has not limited himself in general. Uh, as to what that may mean. The one exception I think I can argue in the light of Scripture, it's appointed to man once to die and after this judgment. Now, God, for a sign miracle, did on a number of occasions to overthrow <laughs> that one. I think that James, and, and this is the part of James I did not read, but I think I will, because it, it does, I think it's relevant as we talk about, well, what, what are the limits on what we can ask for? We should, can, my little daughter just died. Can I ask for resurrection? He, he has said this. Is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick and the Lord shall raise him up. And if you've committed any sins, they shall be forgiven him. He doesn't say if any of you is dead. So I think there is one limitation. We shouldn't probably be asking for resurrections once it is very clear the body has gone gone into deterioration. But as far as sicknesses, he does not limit it to cold and flu, although of late flu would be a big deal, I guess, Uh, or a a broken wrist or an owie on the face or something. He leaves it wide open to if you're sick, you can ask for healing. And he promises on some level to raise up that person. And it's not a blanket every time you will feel perfectly well within 24 hours kind of promise. But neither is it a, okay, if anyone's sick, unless he has a cancer or tuberculosis or, no, it's it's just if he's sick, you can pray. 
But, oh, well, clearly, because they were you know, not <laughs> medically advanced. Right. <laughs> Uh, they, they they didn't know about things like terminal diseases because right. no one had died from a disease before. Yeah, that had never happened. We just yeah, and and, and so we go. Uh, we're, we're we're looking at the question. Just kind of giving the big picture again. Yes, we confess the sovereignty of God, but does that mean? It's an interesting sovereignty of God. From that, we deduce that God can do anything and, in fact, will do anything according to his good pleasure. God is sovereign. Therefore, God can't do anything because he's already committed himself to a plan. And we can't, poss- <laughs> right. and we can't possibly alter that plan because we have to factor in his omniscience and eternal plan. So prayer does change things. Prayer does not change things. Both deduce from the sovereignty of God and his other attributes. This is why we read the Bible. (laughs) Yeah, and it's a a manipulation of the word sovereignty into something it doesn't mean in any other context. Where, like, if you you have a mighty king Mm -hmm. who has authority over all things, his sovereignty compels you to come and ask him for the things that you desire. Mm -hmm. It does not compel you to say, oh, well, he'll do everything and I'll, I'll just go along with it. Yep. Like uh, Eli says, yeah. it's the will of the Lord. The will that the will of the Lord be done. Be, or Hezekiah, there'll be peace in my time. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, and that's sometimes what we end up with. And I, and I have heard this from certain strains of Calvinists. Not, it's not universal by any means. Because I've heard very good sermons in the other direction from other Calvinists. But I have heard and seen people say, in the name of Calvinism, well, since you cannot possibly be altering God's eternal plan, therefore, what you are altering is your own thought and thought life and heart condition. But wait, isn't that also altering God's eternal plan? <laughs> isn't anything we ask for, anything we do, therefore, a possible threat to God? Shouldn't we just go with the flow because whatever will be, will be because God's ordained it? Right. And then why prayer of yeah. all the things you could do to adjust your attitude yeah. or... Get in a yeah. better headspace or whatever. Yeah, how about go outside and jog for a while? Yeah, touch, touch uh, grass. <laughs> uh, in the original article, I, I repeated two stories. They're not they're not original to me. One is from uh, Francis Schaeffer's book. That I believe it's from Death in the City, although I think he may use it in a couple places. He's and he's talking about this reality. What he's talking about. God being real in the sense that we can talk to him and he can do real things in the universe that we can't do and that seem, from our point of view, to be impossible uh, and that many would call miraculous, not sign gifts, not authorizing new revelation, but God simply stepping in to help his people when they call upon him. Uh, It was 1947. He was flying home to St. Louis across the North Atlantic. He's on a small uh, DC-4, four-engine airliner, and... uh, Something goes wrong with one of the engines, and the pilot comes online and says, uh, we just lost an engine, folk. You might want to start getting ready for an overseas evacuation. And then a short time later, the pilot comes back on, we just lost a second engine. We will be making an overwater landing in five, four. You know, it's beginning to, the clock's ticking, uh, because without two of the engines on the same wing, well, with two engines of the same wing gone, they can't. They literally cannot fly. It's The plane's going to go down. Uh, the plane had sent out an SOS because going down the middle of the Atlantic, they're going to hope that there are going to be some ships nearby to pick up the, the survivors, if there be any. Uh, the signal reached um, the United States, Canada, the United States, and it was flashed. And in those days, this was a big thing. When some big story comes on, you flash it across the country, and within a very short time, every radio station in the country is announcing this great message because that's how you draw people. You have to be the one that has the big message. If everyone else has it, you don't have it. People stop listening to you. So it was really easy in those days to, if you can get on the system, everyone in the country is going to hear about it. And way off in St. Louis, Missouri, Mrs. Schaefer, Edith, and her daughters heard this. This plane is going down. They thought very quickly, that's Dad's plane. That's Fran's plane. And so she gathers them together to start praying. Meanwhile, Dr. Schaefer is praying diligently on the plane and the plane is going down and going down and going down. They can look out the windows. It's a moonless night, but they can still see the waves. They're so close. And then just as the waves are coming up to smack them, the engines reignite. The plane lifts up and goes on home. 
thinks it's way to Canada. And Dr. Schiffer says that afterwards he 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 set out the pilot and just to say, what was that all about? And I thought, it's the funniest thing. You know, sometimes a, an engine will go out. We, 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 that's happened for you. But if you lose two out of the same wing, the rule is the plane's done. You can, it, it never makes a comeback. I don't understand it. It's impossible. And Dr. Schiffer said, I can tell you why they restarted. <laughs> what? Why? I was praying to my father in heaven and asking him, and he restarted the plane for us. He says, the guy gave me the strangest look ever. And <laughs> <Walked away. laughs> And so we, and so we just say, oh, well, that was just a coincidence. <laughs> God <It wasn't... laughs> does not play dice with the universe. Yeah. The other is from a commentary I picked up ages ago, and I, I have not made much use of, although it's a fine commentary, so I could, it's more of a devotional thing by uh, uh, Earl Kelly. It's called James, the Primer for Christian Living. It was published in the 70s. And he tells the story. I don't. I could not trace where the original story came from, although he he footnotes it. But I couldn't go back any further than his footnote. This was in Nigeria, the Yagba people. I hope I'm saying that right. Uh, it, missionaries had been at work there for some time. It was it was a religiously mixed color their uh, country. There were pagans who worshipped idols. There were Muslims, and there were these new fledgling Christians who were very excited about their faith and took it all, as a matter of fact, this is the real God we're talking about. This is the living God. Well, as in Elijah's day, there was no rain. And after a time, all of these groups began to realize, we need rain. And so amongst themselves, they began to say, well, we should call on our God. Sound familiar? <laughs> so the, the pagans went first. They picked a day, and they appealed to their idol, Chengo. And the witch doctor climbed a palm tree and began to shout to his God. And on the ground, the people beat on drums and blew horns and shouted and screamed. And they cut their bodies with stones and knives. Sound familiar? Yes. This went on for four days. And the witch doctor was up in the palm tree so he could be closer to the gods and get their attention better. On the fifth day, the witch doctor came down from the tree, sacrificed a bull to Shango, drank its blood, and ate the whole animal. And there was still no rain. Magic failed them. Well, now the Muslims are going to step in. Well, they're, they don't believe in many gods. They only believe in one god. And Muhammad is his prophet. So they got together and they appealed to all a confidence that they would be heard. Because they didn't worship idols. They called for a week of fasting. And then day and night they cried out the traditional creed, there is no god but Allah and Muhammad is his prophet. And at the end of the week they sacrificed a ram at the river. And there was no rain. Finally, the Christians decided to pray. The native pastor made a suggestion during the worship service. As I recall, um, I just have my notes in front of me, because I recall the story he actually went to the white missionary and said, we, we should do this. And the white missionary sort of played devil's advocate. Well, why do you think? I mean, their gods failed them. And... A man thought from him, he bright, lightened up with a big smile and said, yes, because they worship sticks and stones and all is no God, but we worship the living God. He will hear us. Do you have any scripture to back that up? Uh, yes, there is that wonderful passage in James. <laughs> it tells us to pray, pray for rain of all things. <laughs> so uh, the missionary uh, announces the pastor's decision to the congregation. He called for corporate prayer. And the drums began to beat in the village and send out the message, now we are going to see the power of the God who lives. The Christians are going to pray for rain. The mon Monday was hot. As evening came on and the bell tolled the call to prayer, there wasn't a cloud in the sky. In the large church building, the pagans were on one side and the Muslims on the other. They'd come to see the power of the God who lives. The Agba believers should come with their wide-brimmed umbrella hats. Because <laughs> during rainy season, they wanted to have their hands free. And they didn't want to be carrying an umbrella like white people did. So they had these big wide-brimmed hats to keep the rain off. And they came wearing them. And um, the white missionary says, um, what, what are you doing with those things in church? The old white man, haven't we come to pray for rain? We'll need these when we leave. <laughs> <laughs> And so the missionary read the passage from James, and believers got down on their knees, and one by one they began to pray, Lord, we need rain. Glorify your name among the pagans and the Muslims and our Yakwa country. And the Christians prayed. They prayed for 
for five minutes, nothing. For 10, nothing. Then 20, still nothing. After 25 minutes, they heard the first few drops of rain plop against the iron sheeting that made up the church roof. After five more minutes, they had to stop praying because they could no longer hear each other. Torrents <laughs> of rain were falling from heaven. It rained for four days and four nights, which was all right because they had their umbrellas with them and wore them on their heads and went home rejoicing. <laughs> and I think that's we, clever. I think umbrellas <laughs> are obsolete. We need these heads. <laughs> yes, the new, the new fashion well, statement. The. But this is the thing. Would we have this kind of faith? Would we go, oh, yeah, we should pray and throw a line in about prayer and watch California go through another year of drought? Or are we willing to get this serious and trust God this much? Maybe we simply believe that California is under God's judgment to such a degree that we don't have any confidence. Or maybe like Elijah, we were the ones who called for drought in the first place. I don't think so. <laughs> Might have considered it, but I don't think we're too comfort oriented. I doubt, I doubt that any Christians got together and did that one. But the, I know people who are praying that California will fall into the sea, but they yeah. don't generally live here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, well, well. They're normally in Texas, which is also dry. <laughs> and <laughs> A couple of uh, – the, and people can say, well, the, this is uh, only anecdotal evidence. You know, what kind do you want? This is, these are real <laughs> testimonies of God's people uh, explaining when God did something unusual – something that maybe some people might call miraculous. Puritans would probably call it a special providence. Yeah, if you had like an empirical study saying, ah, yes, prayer to the living God works 92% of the time. <laughs> whereas, you know, then you're doing the same thing of putting God into the box of yeah. this is how he runs the universe. If you pray in this way for so long. Right. Yeah. It's defaulting to the same right. thing. So that kind of evidence would not actually testify to anything. It's invalid. You know, so a moment of personal anecdotal evidence that uh, when my eldest daughter, Emily, was a real little girl, um, probably around three or so, three and four or five, somewhere in there, because this, this happened, these kind of things happened more than once. Uh, her, one of her favorite mantra, mantras was, Daddy, shouldn't we pray? <laughs> You know you've done a good job, or somebody has, when every time something serious <laughs> comes up and you're looking hard at your wife and she's looking hard at you and the little girl over here says, shouldn't we pray? Like, yes, <laughs> we should. Thank you. Uh, the, the first one that comes to mind, this is, this is the one that easily is passed off as coincidence. She was looking out our back window. And she saw a cat and she's always loved cats and she really was fascinated by cats. And she said something to the fact that there's a cat out there. And then after a while, the cat went away and she expressed her sorrow. The cat's gone. Kate was in the kitchen cleaning up and said, um, well, dear, why don't you pray to God and ask him to send you another cat to look at? <laughs> I'm laying on the couch in the in kind of off to one side in another room saying, um, and I'm starting to talk and say, dear, don't you think you explained to her that prayer, and I didn't get very far because in the meantime, Emily had bowed her head, prayed, and asked God to send her another cat. And she'd wandered over to the front door as opposed to the back door, which is a glass door with a screen. And as I'm getting to the point, don't you think you should explain to her about prayer? Emily says, there's a cat. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, I think she could explain to you <laughs> about prayer. <laughs> exactly. I said, never mind. And, um, that was that. Uh, there was another, okay, there's, there's a couple more of these. The, 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 you know, cat, and it was a different cat, by the way. The cat didn't just go around the house. Uh, but, you know, it's an, it was a neighborhood of cats, so that's not that big a deal, right? There was a time when I had bought the girls uh, a Dollar Tree copy of Lassie, the mm -hmm. dog, the dog. And, um, you know, it was, it was a dollar. And so we went to put it in, and what appeared was that sparkling mini square. What's it called? When all you see are squares of light and no real picture. Pixelated. Pixelated. All thing, the whole thing was pixelated. And I said, "Oh, I'm sorry, girls. Um, it looks like it's not going to work." And Emily, of course, said, "Shouldn't, Shouldn't we pray?" pray? <laughs> it's like punched the button and took it out. I thought, "All right, well, it's obviously not going to work," but. <laughs> 
since she is willing to commit to prayer, I should, my end is to do what I can do, which isn't much. So I, I blew, I blew dust, I blew off the dust inside the machine or whatever. I don't know if that even does anything. And I, I think it the, makes it worse because you're wedging the <laughs> dust inside the yeah. machine. <laughs> and I took the DVD and, and wiped it on my shirt or whatever I was wearing. And I put it back in and we prayed and suddenly in living color, Lassie. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> I think it was that same year Christmas came along and we had put up strings of lights. You know the kind of lights where if you lose one, you lose them all? Mm-hmm. Yeah, for some reason we bought those. It, 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 you no longer had to, but somehow we had managed to do that. And, em, and Emily was helping me trying to sort through lights and we saw that, okay, the whole thing is dead because one of them doesn't work. And this was like 30 lights, 30 little light bulbs. One of them was dead. There was no way of telling which one. And I didn't want to mess with it. And say, Emily, it would take us too long to figure it out. And she said, shouldn't "Shouldn't we we pray? pray? (laughs) And at that point I said, Emily, you have more faith than I do. You better pray. (laughs) So she prayed. And then we went to, I think like the second or third light in the strand, pulled it out and put a new one in and the lights came on. It was like the <laughs> first or second try. Okay. All right. Thank you, Lord. Mm-hmm. But this is technology. This is this is the part of the universe that surely God is shut out of. Because technology mm. is Newtonian electronics, if there is such a thing. It's electronics, uh, Maxwellian electronics, I guess, based on Newtonian physics. There, there shouldn't be any shuffle room. I mean, if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. Sure, we might kick it and thump it, and that could make it work. But... Praying to God and God somehow going to turn it on? That's not. Uh, I'm sorry. Well, the, yes, it does. The computers are the the devil's <laughs> machines. Yes. Uh, only he has authority over them. <laughs> Sometimes you think, but it turns <laughs> out God is the Lord of computers as well, of technology, of cars that won't start, and all kinds of things. Where we look at it and say, there's got to be a scientific ex- explanation. And if there is, then that's that it's limited by that. If, if it's a dead battery or if it's a, a fuse that won't work or if it's a disconnected wire, then that's what it is. And no amount of prayer can fix that until it does. <laughs> and hmm. that's something that Christians, I think, at, the, at least at the end of the 20th century, were really struggling with. Maybe... New ageiness has has kind of countered that, and maybe we're a little more open to possibilities than we once were. But we need to make sure that the possibility is grounded in God's word, not just in the, well, isn't it wonderful? Anything can happen. No, (laughs) what can happen is what God wills to happen, and God, again, is sovereign. That's what sovereignty Mm -hmm. means. He can do what he wants, and he's not limited by our understanding of science. Uh, Whether it comes to asking for healing from something that seems incurable or some device starting when we desperately need it to start. Um, and then, of course, again, there's always the possibility that he comes up with some completely different um, solution. If I'm praying for my car to start because I desperately need to get somewhere because I say I have medicine to take somebody, take someplace, and it won't start, it won't start, and up comes a guy on a horse and says, need a ride? <laughs> I, You know, that's a valid answer to prayer. What I really am after is not my car starting. What I'm really after is I need to get this medicine someplace. And if God provides a horse... <laughs> okay. <laughs> Wasn't what they had in mind. You ever heard that old joke about yes. the the flood and there's a yeah. guy on the roof uh-huh. and <laughs> I'll just I'll just say it for the benefit of anyone who hasn't heard it. Basically, the guy's on the roof or he said uh the, the rain's coming down, he's sitting on his porch and somebody comes up to him and goes like it, everything's there's a flood coming. Like you, you got to get out of here. Come on, let the, get in my car. I'll take you out of here. He goes, no, no, no. I, I've prayed to God and I've I've asked Him to save me from the flood waters. I'm I'm, I'm taking care of him. And the guy goes, whatever, and drives off. Well, waters risen up a little bit. Now he's sitting on like the the roof of his patio, basically. And uh, this guy comes up in a little paddle boat and he goes, you got to get out of here. You're gonna drown. Get in get in my paddle boat with me. And we'll I'll take you to safety. He goes, no, I've prayed to God. He's going to save me from this. I've asked him to save me from this. I'm good. I'm, I'm taken care of. And finally, he's like at the very top of the, the 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 peak of his roof. And somebody comes by 
a helicopter flies by and they go, sir, climb onto the ladder, please. You need to, we're going to rescue you. We're going to get you out of here. And he goes, I have prayed to God and he's going to save me. Well, the flood waters rise even more and he ends up drowning. Then he gets to heaven and he asks God, God, I prayed for you to to save me from the flood waters. Why didn't, why didn't you save me? He goes, I sent you a kayak and a paddle boat and a helicopter. What more did you want? <laughs> <laughs> but I'm bum. And, yeah. and exactly. And so does God have to do something really crazy and miraculous from our point of view? No. But can he? And when everything seems against us and there doesn't seem to be any way out, can God move reality in such a way that some people will say, that's a miracle. Others will say, God cheated on that one. And we can simply <laughs> say, our Father heard our prayers. Mm-hmm. And that's why he told us to pray. So we look at Elijah. He prayed. He prayed in terms of the covenant law. He prayed in terms of God's written word. He was not practicing, practicing magic. He wasn't trying to manipulate God or twist his arm. He was looking, God had said this. I'm asking God to keep his word. And God did. And when the test was over, God was only too happy to relent and send the rain again, although it hadn't had the effect that Elijah hoped for, but that's the story for next time. Hmm. All right. That's a good place to wrap it up. Uh, Do we have recommendations this week? Yes. I recommend The Runaway Bunny. (laughs) It's a beautiful children's book. Okay. I know about it. Why don't you at least give the audience what it's... Uh, oh, I am not idea. aware of it. I wish to know. You're not aware of it. Okay. So it's by Margaret Wise Brown of Goodnight Moon fame. Okay. And it's the story of a little bunny who wanted to run away. So he said to his mother, I am running away. <laughs> and each page has a, a lovely little black and white illustration of the bunny and what he's going to do. And then the bunny's mother and what she says she's going to do. She says, if you're going to run away, I'm going to run after you because you are my little bunny. So there's a picture of little bunny, picture of bunny's mother. And then on the next page, it's a lovely color illustration with no words, just describing, just showing what they've done in their imagination. So he says, oh, well, I'll become a tree or uh, I'll become a flower in a secret garden. So you can't find me. And mother says, well, I'll become a gardener and I will find you. (laughs) And there's the color illustrations have sort of references to classic paintings and things, which is really fun, which, you know, those things you don't notice when you're being read to as a child that you notice when you are reading to your own kids. Anyway, it's just a really lovely book and Gretchen really likes it. Um, She doesn't care for a lot of books, but she likes the colors. (laughs) Lovely. Ryan, do you have one? Uh, last weekend, one of the events that happened was my birthday. And oh, happy I, birthday, Brian. Happy birthday. Well, thank you. Normally, Emily and I do not get mornings to sleep in because she has Sundays and Mondays off. And Sunday, we get up early and go to church. And Monday, I get up early and go to work. And uh, on the day that I have off, besides those two days, which is uh, Saturday, she gets up early and goes to her work because she works on a Saturday shift. So to celebrate for me, she took off work on Saturday and we got to sleep in, (laughs) which was quite magical, honestly. Um, And so that's, that's part one. And the second part is uh, after we did all that, after we slept in and we had breakfast and did all sorts of other things. uh, We also, did yard work in the backyard because in Wisconsin, your yard is neglected for four months out of the year. And um, our neighbors had also been throwing garbage into our backyard and Mm. fun kinds of things like that. And of course we have two dogs. So there were, uh, there were uh, a plethora of um, landmines spread throughout, if I can put it that way. So, on Saturday, we just spent about an hour and a half, two hours, something like that, just making the yard look lovely. And it does look lovely. We went to Aldi a couple different times. Aldi, by the way, is a magical place. 
it like we bought uh yard edging mm. and food and also a tree <laughs> like a little a little birch sapling that was about Aww. I don't know, two and a half feet tall, something like that. Uh, so we we did that and we made the yard look lovely. So I just recommend uh, gardening. It's a great way to um, spend an afternoon to make your abode look lovely. Uh, if you have a yard or if you have someplace that you can cultivate green things and and bring beauty to your uh surroundings it's it's just wonderful for that and also it's um you know mary mistook jesus for a gardener and <laughs> there is a kind of beauty in that to uh image christ then in, in that way as well well funny you should mention that brian because our family has been working on our backyard for some time we actually kind of committed to it after many years of saying we ought to and not. <laughs> and uh, Marilyn, with a friend of hers, built a garden bed for tomatoes, and we just finished putting freshly bought dirt of various sorts in it. Well, I'm not going to talk about tomatoes. I'm going to talk about squash, zucchini particularly. In past Good years, stuff. Yeah, when God has blessed us, uh, zucchini just, it's the one thing that does grow pretty well in our backyard. And we don't have a great backyard. It's a very clayey sort of soil. But usually we can get that to to grow and it when it grows it just comes on like gangbusters it's all over the place and it's the kind of thing of oh who can have too much zucchini um well <laughs> <laughs> when they start growing the size of clubs you, you kind of wonder if maybe you can but there's so much you can do with it if you have if you come from a family with a southern background like i do you can fry it Ooh, it's good <laughs> fried you can put it into a vegetable medley you can and this is what my wife and girls do you can make zucchini bread which has mm. lots of chocolate chips in it yes so it's just it's like dessert you can't even tell it's zucchini nope. and other such things and you know what even if you only get one or two plants to grow and they're hardy enough to bring forth uh, three or four zucchinis, you know, every week or so. That's a lot of zucchini. And if nothing else, you can give it away to friends who will love you for giving them fresh vegetables. So, yeah, yep. let's get on with the gardening this year. Amen. All right. Thank you both so much for joining me on this episode. And thank you to our listeners who joined us for this episode. If you'd like to follow us, you can do so on our YouTube channel, on Rumble. You can follow our Facebook page. And uh, if you want to subscribe to us, if you're not already, uh, you can do so through any number of podcast catchers. If, if there is one that we're not on, please let us know. Uh, you can email us at haltingtowardzion at gmail.com. If you would like to support us financially, you can do so at anchor.fm forward slash halting towards Zion. And thank you to everyone who does support us financially. You help make the show possible. Thanks to David Maxson for all of his uh, magic and editing work that he does uh, to help get this show out to our listeners. Thank you so much again for joining us. And we look forward to having you join us next time. Bye.